Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at East Silicon with Carlos Mathian, who's going to talk today about new things you can do with memory. As we start pushing the performance of some of these devices, we're starting to run into things uh, that we used to solve with scaling. Now we're starting to look at memory for different uses. What's changed here? How, what's happening with memory and how are we using it differently? Memory has really stopped being a commodity uh, in ASIC design, in particular in the new architectures that are emerging with artificial intelligence. So as we will show, there is a need to change quite drastically the, the von Neumann architecture that has been followed to date. What are we looking at here? So this represents um, a traditional architecture for a, a processor. Uh, in a very, very simplified way uh, from the point of view of current artificial intelligence implementations. If you think about it, the classical von Neumann uh, architecture has a hierarchy of memories, okay? So we typically have the bulk of our storage off-chip. This would be our classical DRAM. Then we have some large on-die memory that we use as temporary um, storage. And then very close uh, to our processing engines, to the logic that needs to process the data, we might have smaller memory portions uh, where we have the most immediately needed uh, data. Now, if you think about it, there is a lot of data movement from off chip into the main memory and into the smaller pieces until it reaches the logic. If you're gonna spend 99% of your time processing that data, then it works. It works very well. It's not very inefficient, right? However, the drastic change that the artificial intelligence brings to the game is the fact that the data needs to be processed and stored and reprocessed and restored many, many, many billions of times per uh, inference or per training. And that change is what breaks this von Neumann architecture. And so now what you're doing is starting with the data as the starting point as opposed to the architecture that you had before, right? Correct. The data, the, the big question now is, if I have to circle the data between memory and processing elements many times, how can I minimize the data movement? Because there is a lot of power that is burned in that data movement. And artificial intelligence, which is a highly parallel, highly repetitive uh, process, is all about power efficiency. So minimizing the data movement is key. And you may have hundreds of these elements or even thousands of these elements on a single chip, right? This is just one, one piece of it. Correct, correct. So this is a very high level representation. We would have many of these processing engines and inside of every processing engine you would have many processing elements. Uh, typically people will speak about the MAC block, the multiply accumulate block, which is just one very tiny little piece, but indeed you will have millions of, or, or maybe not millions, but thousands certainly of those processing elements. So what's changing now? What, what's being done differently that wasn't being done in the past? Two things basically. If you look at this diagram, one thing that you will want to do is to optimize the interconnect between the memory and the processing engines. You want this to be particularly efficient to minimize, once again, the power dissipated through data movement. That's one possibility. The other possibility is to connect the processing and the storage to couple them as tightly as you can. Because at the end of the day, this is exactly what you're going to be doing. You're going to be processing data, storing data, processing data, storing data. The closer you can tie them together architecturally, the, most efficient you, the more efficient you will, you will be. So do you go all the way into the memory with the processing or do you step back and go, this is close enough? And that is a fascinating question for which there are clearly two positions in the market today. You have the people that have decided to go the way of re-architecting the memories so, so as to embed the processing into the memory proper, which is kind of black magic in a way because that's analog design. It's very powerful, but at the same time, it's, first of all, very disruptive 
it changes the paradigm of how memories are built and used. And second, uh, it, it's quite hard to do. But there are a number of companies pursuing that road uh, to, to some success. The alternative is to say, well, let's stay with more classical memory architectures. But at the end of the day, the memory is composed of two elements, the bit cell, where the data is stored, and a lot of peripheral logic that controls how that bit is read and written and moved around. If you expand that peripheral logic to contain also some uh, programming, some, some additional mathematical functions, then you can bring the computation very close to the bit cell without really modifying how the bit cell proper is built. Which one's better? What are the trade-offs that you have to think about? Um, <clears throat> as I said, everything that happens in the analog realm uh, pretty much feels like black magic to me. It might be my upbringing, who knows? Um, but it is um, way more disruptive because we live in a, in a digital world, if you think about it. So all of the design process is digital in nature nowadays. So if you want to do that, you are really disrupting the design process. That's why in this particular case, I was uh, going to focus on the digital approach, which is equally powerful, yet way less disruptive. Let's drill down a little bit into what happens when you move the processing closer to the memory. What happens? How does this actually work? L let's take a, a simple example. Let's think about how we read and write into a memory. A memory at the end of the day is nothing but a matrix where you have a series of bits that compose every word and then you have a number of words uh, in, in your structure, okay? So typically the way you write is you write word by word. In this case, we have chosen a couple of uh, uh, Hawaiian words to exemplify. So here we write the word aloha, okay? And next time, we can write the next word, kahuna. Very nice. Now, what if what I really need to read is actually the first letter of every word, which in this case, by the way, builds the word akamai, which means clever. So if we want to read every letter, the way a memory is built today, you need to read every word out, so it will be you know, a large number of reads, one, two, three, four, five, and six in this particular case, you will take one character out of every word, you will build a new word, and then, and only then, can you send the data to its subsequent processing uh, step. Not very efficient, right? What if, what if we added the possibility into the memory to read by columns as opposed to by rows. If we're able to do that, then in one single read, which is probably going to take a bit longer than your traditional word-based read, we will have directly all of the information that we need, and we will have saved a lot of time, but much more importantly, a lot of power. And this basically is what you're doing here is increasing density of data, right? So you're, you're now doing more per cycle than you were doing in the past. What you are doing is blending the processing with the storage so that uh, you integrate the processing much better. So you are much more efficient. I don't know if I would say that you're increasing the density per se because the data is the same at the end of the day. But this integration allows you to be much more efficient. So another piece of this is minimizing the movement of the data because you have so much data that you didn't have in the past. What happens then? L let me take another example of how this can affect drastically the, the power that you burn in particular and the efficiency of your architecture. Let's imagine that you have a series of memory macros where you store your data and you feed that data into some kind of processing entity. I've chosen the multiply accumulate block here, which is very characteristic for artificial intelligence architectures, okay? Now, if you design your memories and your Mac blocks separately, as it is done today, well, you will end up with a certain size and aspect ratio for your macro, 
and a certain placement of the macros in your block. Now, if you think about moving data from, say, the first bit of this memory macro to the Mac entity, well, depending where you need the data, you are going to have to cross a long distance to reach the, the Mac from the memory, even longer if you are going to the other extreme of this uh, processing element. This is a long time, but in particular, a lot of power, right, as we said. What if, what if, when you are designing memories and processing elements, you do that jointly? So that you design your memory compilers to give you a macro that perfectly fits the size of your Mac element. So that you can align the memory with the Mac perfectly and in such a way that data is moved only straight from the memory to the exact place in the processing element where it is taken. It's a lot shorter distance and hence a lot less power. Where do you see this being used? Is it edge devices? Is it just in the data center? Where, where, who's going to actually deploy this? Everywhere. Because this is a fundamental architectural characteristic. It, it doesn't speak about how many of these elements you're going to have, which at the end of the day is the ba basic distinction between an edge device and a data center device, as long as we remain in the artificial intelligence space. Sure, in the edge you will have more sensors, in the data center you will have less, but the, the core processing element is just a repetition of these structures. In the edge you will have hundreds, in the data center you will have thousands, but the structure itself, the architecture, is and remains the same. You've minimized the, the, the movement of data between the memory and the processing elements but now you still have to move that data somewhere. It has to be put together somehow and, and pre you're basically pre-processing or processing. What happens at the end? How does all the stuff get combined? And that, that's actually a key question because there has been a lot of research and a lot of development focused on optimizing the core processing structures um, for artificial intelligence. But you're pointing to a key, a key item that happens to be very often the biggest bottleneck, which is how do I bring data into my core and out of my core? Now, um, that is a completely separate discussion, but one way of handling that is try to have as much memory as you can on your die so that you do not have to go often inside and outside of the chip. And this has been pretty much the problem in parallelization over the years, right? It's you can parallelize certain things, but now you have to bring it back together somehow. Correct. That, that, is, that is very true. And that's where uh, memory technology has not been able to keep up in terms of the bandwidth that it gives us with, uh, with the development in, in processing power. So that remains one of the, the most constraining elements of modern architectures indeed. And so now what you're doing is really addressing what typically was known as the memory wall, right? Correct. Correct. In this case, we are trying to address a portion of that issue by combining and bringing together processing and memory. Carlos Mathian, thanks very much for a great explanation. My pleasure.